Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. In communities up and down our state, master gardeners make a difference. More than 3,000 Vermonters are now certified master gardeners. They make a difference in their own gardens and landscapes and at any given time there are about 80 community volunteer projects around the state being done by master gardeners. Registration for the 2018 Master Gardener Certification Program is now open and this afternoon we welcome the program's state coordinator to provide more information information about the upcoming course. It is a pleasure to welcome back Brett Halverson. Thanks so much for coming in. Thanks for having me. So who should take the Master Gardener course? Well, the course is really open to anybody who has an interest in gardening. So whether you're a hobby gardener, gardener or you're somebody that um, has a little bit more experience, um, it's really a great class for anybody that has that interest. Mm -hmm. And um, it's really a way to learn more of the theoretical knowledge um, around horticulture and soil science. And um, it's a great way to kind of delve in deeper in those areas. Mm -hmm. That sounds a little bit intimidating, Master Gardener, but really you don't have to be an expert. You don't, no. Um, it's really for folks who maybe have the practical gardening um, knowledge, but want to learn the, the theories and the principles. And it's also focused on creating healthier landscapes, so reducing uses of pesticides and also um, just creating healthier landscapes for both humans and for wildlife. So now this is an online class. Why online? Um, I know it may seem counterintuitive to have a gardening class online, mm -hmm. but um, it's actually a great way for us to reach people all over the state because the mission of UVM Extension is that we're reaching people all over Vermont. And this gives us a really cost-effective way to reach people who live in both urban and rural areas and uh, provide the course in a way that we wouldn't be able to um, if it required an in-person class. I would imagine that would kind of cut down on participation because at any given time there could be weather issues or you know, just uh, complications with um, people's schedules. Yeah, definitely. Um, it def definitely makes it easier for folks um, who don't want to drive at night or who don't want to drive during the winter during mm -hmm. bad weather. And so when's the class offered? So it starts on January 17th this year and it ends on April 25th. And um, the registration deadline is January 16th. So what are some of the topics that the course covers? So the course goes into um, all of the basic um, horticulture classes like botany, soil science and composting, um, plant pathology and entomology, and then um, vegetable gardening, which is always a favorite and then um, looks at annuals and perennials and growing fruit trees and how to do pruning and then also talks about healthy lawns and designing a healthy landscape in your backyard. Mm -hmm. What's expected of someone who takes this online class? So um, students should be available to do about three hours of work every week and it involves um, completing reading assignments and then watching lectures on your own time that are provided for you on our website. And then um, we do have live sessions with the instructors where students can ask questions, and those are once a week for an hour. Mm -hmm. And everything is online using a video conferencing system. So what do you need to take the course? So it's important to have a computer that's up to date and um, also to be to feel comfortable using email, um, getting onto a website that requires a login, and also um, using a video conferencing system. And we use a system called Zoom. Mm -hmm. And is that something that's pretty easy to access? It is, yeah. It's a link that's provided, and you click on the link, and it should open. And is there, are there exams? There are, yeah. So the weekly format is um, you're, watching the re you're doing the reading, then you're watching the lecture, and then um, you're posting a discussion question on the website. And then those are discussed during the live Q&A sessions. And then um, we have those live Q&A sessions. And then at the end of the course, there's a, a final exam that folks are required to do. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a volunteer component as well. Do you have to volunteer? You don't, actually. Um, for the second year in a row, we've decided that um, 
we're going to offer just the course or the volunteering component. So students can choose um, if they're really busy and they don't want to do the volunteering now, um, they can just take the course and receive a certificate of home horticulture at the end. But for those that really want to give back to their community and teach others about gardening or teach kids about gardening, the volunteering is a great way to do that. It's also a great way to get hands-on experience. And what kind of a commitment is the volunteer part? Uh, the volunteer part is um, an internship that you do after the course, and it's uh, 40 volunteer hours that you complete in two years following the course. Oh, okay, so it doesn't have to be a full time 40 no. hours. No, yeah, just uh, 40 hours total in a two year time period. And what's the cost? The cost is um, if you're going to do the volunteering, it's $4.25 or $30 um, for each module because there's 14 modules total. Mm -hmm. um, and it's $4.75 if you just do the certificate of home horticulture and you don't do the volunteering. Now, you mentioned the benefits of becoming a master gardener. What are some of the other benefits that people enjoy? Um, well, it's a great way to connect with other people who are like-minded in the community who love gardening. And um, it's a great way to learn from other folks. Uh, a lot of master gardeners really like to mentor new students. So it's a great way to meet other people who have a lot of knowledge and um, want to give back. And then um, we also have a membership network of over 600 people. So um, there's lots of special offers and educational opportunities that we offer to that network. You also do a lot of uh, community projects around the state. We do, yeah. There's over 90 projects in total all over the state. And those are ongoing projects that Master Gardeners have started. And um, they're at all different types of places like schools and historical sites and libraries and all different kinds of places across the state. And so who teaches in the Master Gardener program? So it's taught by UVM faculty primarily. And then we also have a few green industry experts that teach. And um, yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. Now, um, is there financial aid available? Um, there is. We do offer a number of grants and scholarships. Gardner Supply um, has given us some funds to do partial scholarships this year for those who need it. And then we also um, receive grants from a number of different agencies, and there's more information about that on our website. Mm -hmm. And as far as um, the website, can you give uh, folks at home the, uh, that information so they know how to, where to call or where to find the info? Sure, yeah. So our website is uvm.edu slash mastergardener. Or you can call us for more information, and our number is 656-9562. And Brett, remind folks, too, that you don't have to be a great gardener to take advantage of this. You don't. Yeah, it's really um, open to anybody that's interested in gardening, and it's a great way to dive in deeper and learn more. And um, yeah, you don't have to be an expert, but if you do have experience, um, there's also a lot to learn always. And um, our experts are really great and wonderful teachers. And once again, just in a nutshell, tell folks what the time commitment is for this. So the total time commitment is about three hours a week over the course of 14 weeks. Mm -hmm. And there's also a helpline? There is, yeah. Um, we have a helpline where master gardeners answer questions, and that's something you can get involved in after the course. Which is really great because you actually talk to a person. <laughs> you do, yeah, yeah. And so how many people um, have been taking this course <coughs> traditionally? Um, we usually have about 100 people take the course each semester. Wow, that's terrific. Yeah, it's quite a few. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us and talking about that. Thank you. Now, Vermont's relatively short growing season makes it a challenge to raise crops used in brewing, but that hasn't stopped Vermonters from trying and succeeding. Keith Silva visited a Vermont business uh, that's got brewmasters and beer drinkers going local. What's going on in this barn hasn't happened in Vermont for over 150 years. I am uh, Vermont's maltster, yes, with an S. <laughs> At Peterson's Quality Malt in Moncton, the ancient process of malting starts with a canoe paddle, a couple of converted maple sap tanks, and a lot of passion. It goes back about 11,000 years. Um, this is a very simple process, but complicated at the same time. Uh, I'm taking cereal grains and I'm converting the starches into sugars that can be used uh, in brewing and distilling. You can malt any kind of cereal grain. Um, so that's whether it be wheat, barley, rye, the uh, three most common ones. Um, it's a fairly simple three-step process. You're going to soak the grain, then you're going to let it germinate, and then you're going to kiln it. Drying the grain in the kiln locks the sugars in place. Mill it, add water, yeast, maybe some hops, allow it to ferment. 
and you've got beer. Vermont is first in the nation for breweries and brew pubs per capita. Peterson considers his business craft malt, which means, like the state's craft brewing industry, it's robust but small. At this point, we probably have about 10 regular customers. Most of our brewers are within 25 miles. The larger breweries couldn't use us. Uh, we don't have enough supply for them to do that realistically. Uh, so mostly we're working with smaller craft breweries and brew pubs. My estimation is that of the beer that's made in Vermont and that stays in Vermont, so that, that eliminate the stuff that goes out of state, um, that probably uses roughly about 22 million pounds um, a year. And when we're going full capacity, we can do about 200 tons. So r roughly, roughly uh, 2%. What Peterson's business lacks in size, it makes up for in flexibility, creativity, and uniqueness. We have them in a 500 liter. All distinctions, right master now, brewer Todd Hare we'll looks for in the beer he brews at Foam in Burlington. We're probably using right now around 60, 75 percent of our our base malt bill comes from 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 Andrew Peterson and. Um, that's a pilsner. Uh, we use a lot of his wheat um, as well, um, but we find that that, that, that malt is, is fantastic for the beers that we're doing. Um, it just contributes a really nice uh, flavor in the end of the beer and so forth, but definitely unique. I like the idea of driving the industry with a better product. I, I want to taste a better beer. How do you get there? And with beer, it's somewhat limiting. I mean, sure, you can throw in some puree of something or other, but you can't have beer without malt and how do you make a better malt? How do you get a better flavor out of it? Um, and that's, that's sort of what's driving us at this point. It's like, how, what can we do in every batch to, to get the most extract out of it, to give the brewers something truly different that they haven't had before? All the grain Peterson malts is grown in Vermont. Finding grain in an agricultural landscape dominated by corn and hay is challenging, which is why Peterson contacted UVM Extension. UVM Extension was one of the first places I reached out to. Uh, I was familiar with uh, the, the grain trials they were doing up in Alberg um, and talked to, to Heather and Erica there. They've been invaluable. We've been working with Andrew for many years. We've provided him with lots of valuable connections, both in the farming community, um, in the brewing community, um, and with other craft maltsters throughout the Northeast. And now helping farmers grow barley so that he has product <laughs> to use in his business. A really important part of Extension is bringing people together. Um, creating networks and creating opportunities for people to meet each other and learn from other people, not just from us. The research they've been doing is stuff that I'm looking at every year, um, determining what I'm going to do, how I'm going to do it. Um, they have introduced me to most of the grain growers in the state, which they're not that, they're very many, but they know all of them well. Um, they uh, also have a testing lab now, so they're able to do malt quality uh, testing, which is, again, I couldn't tell a brewer that what my barley's got without them. So here you actually have an academic wing that is legitimizing what we're doing, which is fantastic. If the trend holds, craft brewing will continue to increase in Vermont. Its success will depend on the product and the consumer. I think most craft beer consumers aren't thinking about the ingredients in their beer. Um, they don't think it's wrong, it's just never been a conversation we've had before. The Vermont brewers are just an outstanding group and they've put Vermont on the map so that tourists are driving here to get their beer. Uh, for me to play a part in that is phenomenal for me. I, that's, that's, that was my dream, to be part of the Vermont brewing world and watching these guys produce um, and then being able to use something local that uh, came from, from the hard work that we're putting in is incredibly rewarding. Peterson's Quality Mall is a one-of-a-kind Vermont business. And with any luck, it won't stay that way for long. In Moncton, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Well, thank you, Keith, and thank you for joining us. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.